Last year, we released our documentary, The Ukraine Narratives, covering the Russo-Ukrainian War, the second episode of our documentary series known as Mega. At the time the documentary was made, we expected that this would be a short conflict, and we rushed to get the video out quickly, believing that soon enough, Russian troops would be storming into Ukraine's capital, Kyiv, raising their flag and proclaiming victory. Our thinking was that such a rapid explosion of conflict would create a lot of competing narratives and information warfare, and we sought to play our part in that conflict by examining media discussions surrounding the war, and explaining its background from various perspectives, sourcing the misleading from the truthful. Judging by the response we got, our Ukraine narratives video was a success. Commenters from around the conflict zone, those with families in Russia, Ukraine and Belarus, alongside general audiences, praised us for our measured critique and analysis, complex conclusions, and for being honest and understanding. Safe to say, it's a video to be proud of. But a lot has happened in the year since then. We originally planned to move on from Ukraine and look into new topics for the mega series, believing that the war will be over shortly after the Ukraine narratives released. When we made the Ukraine narratives video, we were rushing to get it out, believing that the whole topic would soon become out of date with Russian troops marching into Kyiv and claiming a victory prize. But like many in the early weeks of the conflict, we overestimated the Russians and underestimated the Ukrainians. Instead of this war being a rapid Russian-led blitzkrieg, it instead became a long, drawn-out battle of attrition, because while the Russians had all their technology and weapons, superiority in seemingly every way, so did the Americans when they fought the Vietnamese, and we all know how that ended. Even in this day and age, all the technology in the world can't save you from the stubborn persistence of someone on their land. Because of the continuation of the war and the shift in its balance of power, we felt a need to go back to work. It's important to examine the conflict and its context in more depth and cover the events that have passed since our last report, necessitating a new production that can help people understand one of the biggest historical events at the start of this decade. In other words, we have a lot of catching up to do. Welcome to Mega, the Ukrainian Divide. You won't need to have watched our previous report to understand this series. It is a sequel of sorts to that video, but it will go over the Ukraine conflict, the issues leading and relating to it, and discuss the motivations behind Russia's decision making. This is our attempt to explain a year's worth of war, and the century or so of context behind it. This series spans a range of topics, some of which may interest you more than others. The series can be watched in a non-linear manner, subjects can be skipped or watched out of sequence, and every chapter will be timestamped. Subchapters are also attached to these which explain which issues or points in time are being discussed. So you can skip to what you want or watch everything in order. Let's begin with examining Ukraine's formation as a country. The turmoil of the Second World War and the collapse of the Soviet Union, and how these things led Ukraine to the conflict we know of today. The story of how Ukraine's politics managed to escalate into a full-scale war only received a brief summary in our last documentary, three minutes or so of an over 50 minute long production. Now that the conflict is becoming more long term, it is important to understand its origins as much as current events. For this, we have to go back over 100 years. As you can see, the world was a very different looking place back then. Lots of the countries we know of today don't exist yet. And there's a problem. Ukraine isn't here. That's because it's split between two empires, two countries, Russia and Austria-Hungary. You see, Modern countries are built on two big ideas, self-determination and territorial integrity. The first is the idea that a group of people, also known as a nation, can decide for themselves what government or state they want to be ruled under. This is called the nation state. The second concept is that these states should have territories reserved for them, protected by borders that other states cannot violate. But this concept is a modern one, a century ago, it didn't really exist, with much of the world being composed of seemingly random, messy, cobbled together kingdoms ruled by old royal families. Without self-determination, 
Weaker populations were often absorbed by the stronger ones, with little power to retaliate. And so, in the early 1900s, Ukraine was occupied. For now. The countries that ruled what is now Ukraine were stuck in the middle of the First World War, known at the time as the Great War. Austria-Hungary was fighting for a German-led alliance called the Central Powers, while Russia was fighting for a British and French-led alliance called the Triple Entente, or more simply known as the Allies. Austria-Hungary was fairly small compared to some of its neighbours, but you can't say the same for the Russian Empire, a country that comprised around one-sixth of the entire planet, containing not just modern-day Russia, but also numerous other populations in Central Europe, Asia, and huge portions of Eastern Europe, including most of Ukraine. All of this was Russia, until 1917, when everything started to unravel. Russia was essentially the only allied country fighting on the war's eastern front, and it wasn't going well for them. Russian troops found themselves in a stalemate with the Central Powers. Russia's economy was essentially dead, and the Russian population was starving, growing tired of sacrificing their lives for a conflict they didn't see was worthwhile. Rebellion mounted against the empire. In March 1917, the Russian Empire was overthrown by the February Revolution, with the aftermath being a situation known as dual power, where control over Russia was split between a new provisional government and the Soviets, a set of militant communist-run workers' councils spread across the country. It was in this chaos that modern Ukraine first emerged. In response to the political crisis in the rest of Russia, a Ukrainian political group known as the Central Rada of Ukraine was founded, and it declared the Ukrainian People's Republic, an autonomous part of Russia with its own identity. The legitimacy of the UPR was eventually recognised by the provisional Russian government, which later reorganised itself as the Russian Republic. But in November 1917, Russia was plunged into disorder again by the October Revolution, where the communists overthrew the Republic and declared their own government, the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic. This led to a civil war between the communists, who became known as the Red Russians, and the White Russians, anti-communists made up of those hoping to either restore the Russian Empire or the Russian Republic. The White Russians didn't recognise Ukraine as a separate territory, considering it a part of southern Russia, but the Reds did. And they formed the communist-aligned Soviet Republic of Ukraine, a state they hoped could eventually take over the UPR. Once again, the UPR responded to this crisis, this time declaring full independence from Russia in January 1918. And in February of that year, their independence was recognised by the Central Powers, who signed a treaty with the UPR known as the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, where the Ukrainians agreed to end their role in the war effort. In March, their independence was also recognised by Soviet Russia, as the Communists signed their own treaty with the Central Powers under the same name. Part of the treaty was that the Russian Communists agreed to give up their claims to Russia's former imperial territories, Ukraine included, and hand them over to the Central Powers giving them total victory on the Eastern Front and leading to Allied reprisals across Russia and its former territories. This resulted in most of Ukraine falling under an occupation from the Central Powers, with the Ukrainian People's Republic being briefly abolished and replaced by a pro-German proxy called the Ukrainian State. Smaller portions of Ukraine were invaded by the French-led Allies in response. But 1918 was the last year of the First World War and all sides of the conflict were exhausted, riddled with disease and losing millions of citizens to the fighting. While the Eastern Front was a great success for the Central Powers, the Western Front was not, bringing members of the Central Powers like Austria-Hungary into disrepair. While the Austro-Hungarian Empire was dwarfed by Russia, it still controlled large portions of Europe. What the Russian Empire was to Europe's east, Austria-Hungary was to its centre. The Austro-Hungarians had lasted longer than the Russians did, but like the Russians, they were being brought towards disaster by the war. In October 1918, the Hungarians decided to leave the empire and form their own republic, spelling the end for Austria-Hungary and leaving the empire's scattered territories to decide for themselves what nations to join or build. 
these remnants were finally achieving self-determination. But with little experience in nation building, they weren't able to form nationalistic ties through shared values, a kind of civic nationalism. Instead relying on the abstract concepts of blood and race, ethno-nationalism, demanding a Hungary for the Hungarians, a Poland for the Polish, a Romania for the Romanians, and so on. This was where the two new ideas of nationhood were starting to butt heads. Territorial integrity, every nation state having its own land and borders, was hard to realise when the populations of these splintered territories weren't neatly packed into different corners. Where there were multiple populations, each new state wanted the land for themselves, inside their borders. Everyone wanted a piece of the pie. How could all of these groups have self-determination, when they each determined the land was theirs? On the 1st of November 1918, the Ukrainians of Austria-Hungary formed what they called the West Ukrainian People's Republic, to represent regions of former Austro-Hungarian territory where Ukrainians could be found. These regions were called Galicia, Bukovina, and Carpathian Ruthenia. But there were other groups in these regions too. In Galicia, around half of the population was Polish. In Bukovina, a notable portion of the territory was Romanian. And in Ruthenia, a decent chunk was Slovakian. The Polish formed their own state called the Polish Republic. The Romanians joined the neighbouring Kingdom of Romania. And the Slovaks united with the Czechs to form Czechoslovakia leaving the Ukrainians of West Ukraine facing three other countries that wanted the territory for themselves. Bukovina was almost immediately lost to Romania, but the other two territories, Galicia and Ruthenia, were fought over. Suddenly, Ukrainians were represented by two different states, and both of them were under threat. Only 10 days after this West Ukrainian Republic was formed, what was left of the Central Powers surrendered to the Allies, releasing the Soviet Russians from their obligations to stay out of the former Russian Empire, and allowing them to reform the Soviet Republic of Ukraine. A month later, the Ukrainian People's Republic was also restored, as the German-aligned Ukrainian state collapsed after a Central Powers withdrawal. But the exit of the Central Powers didn't make Ukraine any more peaceful. In fact, things got even more chaotic, with the UPR and Soviet Ukraine being reformed and ready to oppose each other. Two more groups also emerged, both opposing all other factions. A militant Ukrainian anarchist group called the Makhnovists, which became known as the Black Army, and lesser known groups dubbed the Green Army. The country also still wasn't free from foreign occupation, as the Allies increased their troop numbers in Ukraine after the German withdrawal as part of their so-called Southern Russia intervention. As Ukraine welcomed the new year of 1919, West Ukraine signed a treaty to unite with the UPR as one large Ukrainian nation, and the Black and Red armies agreed to cooperate with each other as the Reds moved to occupy Ukraine. This made everything worse, as it threatened to drag the elements of Russia's civil war into the remains of Austria-Hungary and its squabbling nationalist groups forcing Ukraine to deal with the infighting between countless different factions. One scholar described the crisis like this. In 1919, total chaos engulfed Ukraine. Indeed, in the modern history of Europe, no country experienced such complete anarchy, bitter civil strife, and total collapse of authority as did Ukraine at this time. Six different armies, those of the Ukrainians, the Bolsheviks, the Whites, the Entente, the Poles and the Anarchists operated in its territory. Kiev changed hands five times in less than a year. Cities and regions were cut off from each other by the numerous fronts. Communications with the outside world broke down almost completely. The starving cities emptied as people moved into the countryside in their search for food. Ukraine was an easy land to conquer, but almost impossible to rule. As he observed the collapse of one authority after another from his self-sufficient village, the peasants' attitude was one of wishing a pox on the city people and all their governments. Even more armies were involved than this describes, as while the Ukrainians and West Ukrainians were formerly one country, they had separate armies. The Entente also had multiple foreign armies involved, and the Poles weren't the only nationalists involved in the conflict. Various other nationalists was still fighting with West Ukraine over Carpathian Ruthenia. But eventually, 
the conflict began to slowly die out as the factions whittled each other down. The Ukrainian Green Army didn't survive 1919, and neither did the Red-Black Alliance or the Allied occupation. The West Ukrainians also lost Ruthenia, which was later given to Czechoslovakia by a peace treaty called the Treaty of Trianon, a deal between the Allies, most of the nationalists of former Austria-Hungary, and Hungary itself. In 1920, the UPR fighters signed a deal of their own called the Treaty of Warsaw, agreeing with the Polish nationalists to give up Galicia and form an alliance against the Red Russians. In 1921, after periods of cooperation and conflict between the Black and Red armies, they turned on each other for the last time, with the Black army being wiped out. By 1922, the Soviets were mopping up what remained of the White Russians and had consolidated their power in both Russia and Ukraine. They decided to make a deal with the Poles and the other ex-Russian territories of Finland and the Baltic states of Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia, leaving them to remain independent outside of communist control in exchange for peace with the Soviets. This allowed the Polish to consolidate control over Galicia and left Ukrainian split between Soviet, Romanian, Czechoslovakian and Polish rule. By this point, the rest of the former Russian Empire had fallen under the control of the Communists, and they dissolved the Ukrainian People's Republic. Communist-held territory was brought together as the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics in 1922, with Ukraine becoming a founding member known as the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, a territory that wasn't just an autonomous part of Russia, but a republic in its own right. You were likely taught in school that World War I took place from 1914 to 1918, but here we can see a different perspective. It was more like 1914 to 1922, when the border wars finally stopped and the changes were finally sorted out. Double the length we know it as. So why is it only thought of as a four-year war, rather than an eight-year one? Well, for the second half, a bunch of the major parties from the first were dead or not participating. That's done some damage to the history books. In 1923, after all the fighting was over, the final border changes looked like this. The result of a conflict where both sides lost. The Allies in the Eastern Front, the Central Powers in the Western Front. Nine new countries were created in this time, and Ukraine wasn't one of them. The Ukrainian independence movement had failed to follow the model of the other nationalist groups from the former Russian and Austro-Hungarian empires and secure Ukraine's place as an independent country, being brutally splintered between various powers instead. Self-determination had been achieved for some, but not for all. But the Ukrainians could claim some success. Recognition as a people. They ensured that Ukraine was recognised as a place of its own, rather than just as a province of a foreign power. These people weren't Russians, Poles or Austrians. They were Ukrainians. The Ukrainian people were their own, born in the fires of war. A decade later, in the late 1930s, Germany had recovered from the humiliation of defeat and came under the leadership of fascist dictator Adolf Hitler, who formed alliances and rearmed his country. Germany's resurgence caused Europe to again split into two factions, one led by France and the UK, the other led by Germany, the Allies and the Axis. Hitler made his first military moves in 1938, when he began invading former Austro-Hungarian territories. First, he annexed Austria itself, and then he claimed Czechoslovakia, which you might remember as one of the countries that had taken a piece of Ukraine in the aftermath of the First World War. The Ukrainians in the Czechoslovak region of Carpathian Ruthenia tried to take advantage of this and declared their own independent state called the Republic of Carpatho Ukraine. But the Germans ignored them, and almost immediately after, with the blessing of Germany, they were invaded by Hungary, placing the Ruthenian Ukrainians back under foreign rule. After it became clear that the peace settlements of the 1920s weren't going to hold, the Soviets worked to ensure their own security. After failing to reach a deal with the Allies, the Soviets signed an agreement with the Germans and agreed to divide Eastern Europe with them. Together, they invaded Poland in 1939, with most of Galicia being absorbed into Soviet Ukraine, and the rest of Poland being divided between Germany, its partners, and other Soviet republics. The Allies reacted strongly to this and demanded that the Germans, 
but not the Soviets, withdraw from Poland under the threat of war. When Germany refused, the Allied nations followed through on their threat, beginning the Second World War. As the war began, the Soviets also took over the Ukrainian sections of Bukovina. The only Ukrainian region left to recover was Ruthenia. The cooperation between the Soviets and the Germans was short-lived, as Hitler was extremely anti-communist and didn't just want to take the remains of Austria-Hungary's dead empire. He wanted the leftovers of the Russian Empire too, as living space. Germany invaded the USSR in 1941, with Ukraine being one of the first Soviet republics to be invaded. The Germans occupied Ukrainian territory and split it between two entities, the district of Galicia and the RKU, neither of which were recognised as independent. Many Ukrainians fled to join the Soviet Red Army or other local partisan groups. Under German occupation, a group known as the OUN, or Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, which had been operating underground in areas like Galicia before the invasions of Poland and the USSR, began to take over large parts of Ukraine. The OUN was split between two factions, the OUNM, led by a man named Andriy Melnik, and the OUNB, led by a man called Stepan Bandera. Both factions raced to entrench their control over Ukrainian territory and gain support from both the local population and the German forces. Eight days after the Nazi occupation began, the OUMB issued a declaration of Ukrainian independence called the Act of Restoration of the Ukrainian State. This declaration proclaimed that a new government was being formed in West Ukraine, and that it would be subordinate to a central Ukrainian government in the capital of Kiev. It also declared that the new Ukrainian state would work closely with the National Socialist Greater Germany, under the leadership of its leader, Adolf Hitler which is forming a new order in Europe and the world and is helping the Ukrainian people to free itself from Muscovite occupation. Bandera and his front hoped that by declaring their loyalty to Germany, the Nazis would allow them to form their independent Ukrainian state. Instead, the Nazis arrested the OUN's leadership and threw them into the concentration camps, with both OUN factions purged. The remnants of the groups formed two different armies, the OUNB-led Ukrainian Insurgent Army and the OUNM-led Ukrainian People's Revolutionary Army. The Nazis also formed their own forces, a Ukrainian volunteer SS group, the Galicia Division, and other local proxies, such as the Ukrainian Auxiliary Police. By 1944, the tide of the war had firmly turned in favour of the Allies, and the Soviets were steadily advancing through German-occupied Europe. The Nazis released Bandera and other OUN leaders from prison, in the hopes that the two OUN factions could unite and attack Soviet troops, damaging their advance. They reorganised the Galicia Division into the so-called Ukrainian National Army, under the leadership of a German-sponsored Ukrainian National Committee linked to both OUN factions, which the Axis finally recognised as representatives of an independent Ukraine. But the German efforts didn't bear fruit. By late 1944, the RKU had already dissolved, with the remaining collaborators fleeing fighting for the Nazis elsewhere in Europe, or carrying out a small insurgency behind Soviet lines. Two months after the recognition of the German-backed committee, the Nazis unconditionally surrendered to the Allies, including the Soviet Union. The war was finally over, but several million Ukrainians had died in the fighting. While Ukraine had still failed to achieve independence, the Ukrainians kept the territory that had been annexed by the USSR after the invasion of Poland. The Soviets had also taken over Carpathian Ruthenia in the last stages of the war and annexed its Ukrainian portions into the USSR, finally uniting the Ukrainian people under one republic, even if it wasn't an independent one. Soviet Ukraine was restored and the OUN returned to the underground. As the Cold War set in and the relations between the USSR and USA turned from alliance to rivalry, the CIA courted the OUN seeking to use OUN-linked expats in Germany and the underground inside Ukraine itself for intelligence gathering and psychological warfare against the Soviets and their communist allies in Poland, Czechoslovakia and Romania. To this end, the OUN attempted to whitewash their past collaboration efforts with the Nazis and emphasise their later opposition to the Nazis that took place after these efforts failed. They hoped to earn support in the West by appearing to be both anti-Nazi and anti-Soviet. Bandera was one of these expats, and remained in Germany to lead the OUN with the aid of US intelligence services, who helped him avoid discovery by the Soviets. Ultimately, 
These efforts failed, as Bandera was later assassinated and the OUN insurgency was wiped out by the Soviet security forces. With remaining sympathizers either fleeing to join the expat community or hiding their views well for the rest of the Soviet era. Fast forward to the end of that era, in the early 1990s, and thanks to a combination of botched reforms, economic stagnation and growing war costs, the USSR was crumbling, just as the Russian Empire and Republic had previously. In March 1991, a referendum was held on preserving the USSR by its leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, and most of the Soviet Union's member states, Ukraine included, voted to stay in the Union in exchange for more sovereignty for their republics. But, in August 1991, a military coup was launched against Gorbachev by Soviet hardliners unhappy with his reforms. The coup failed and Gorbachev returned to power, but with his credibility as a leader tainted. Later that month, Ukraine voted on independence, and the Ukrainian people, seeing the pending demise of the Union over the horizon, voted overwhelmingly to leave the USSR. In December 1991, the leaders of Russia, Ukraine and Belarus decided to declare an end to the USSR, and with its three biggest member states gone, the largest country on the planet fell like a Jenga tower. Fifteen new countries were created, and Ukraine was one of them. For the first time in several hundred years, Ukraine was its own country, completely separate from foreign rule. The fight for Ukrainian independence was finally complete. But there was a problem with this new process. The Soviet republics which these new countries were inheriting everything from weren't designed to become the markers for international borders. The republics were essentially recognitions of different identities and languages within the wider Soviet community, and they swapped lands, gained and lost autonomy and status arbitrarily over time, at the whim of politicians who never imagined they could one day become separate countries. Often, this was without the consultation of local people. Karelia is an example of this a place you've probably never heard of. It used to be its own republic, called the Karelo finnish Soviet Socialist Republic when it first became part of the USSR, but it was downgraded to an autonomous part of Russia in the 1950s. In the same decade, the Oblast of Crimea, which you probably have heard of, was transferred from Russia, its original republic, to Ukraine. If decisions like these were never made, our history could have looked very different now. On top of this, the Soviet authorities had contradictory attitudes towards non-Russian populations throughout the USSR's history, initially promoting a policy known as indigenization, where local languages and identities were emphasized and encouraged, then later reversing the policy and either neglecting these identities or promoting Russification instead. This process was not helped by the fact that before and during World War II, millions of people throughout the Soviet republics were shuffled around into different territories, under a system now known as population transfer, leaving masses of people outside their ancestral homelands and a jumbled mess of populations with an inconsistent level of attachment to their national identities. <laughs> Decision makers could get away with this at the time because the places they were marking out were all still part of one big country and one big grouping, the Soviet people and the Soviet Union. Their sudden leap from regions to whole new countries was chaotic and resulted in territorial disputes, inflaming ethnic tensions almost overnight and even leading to major wars. This instability almost spread to Ukraine through Crimea. Shortly before the end of the Soviet Union, Crimea changed from an oblast to an autonomous Soviet Republic, the status it previously had when it was part of Soviet Russia. In 1992, after independence, Crimea got a new constitution and was renamed to the Republic of Crimea. In 1994, a politician named Yuri Meshkov was elected to the Crimean presidency. He was aiming to pivot the region away from Ukraine and towards Russia, promising moves like granting Crimeans Russian citizenship and moving Crimea's time zone to be in line with Russia's. But his dream didn't last long. In 1995, he was arrested by the Ukrainian military, put on a plane and deported to Moscow. And a new constitution was formed. The Republic of Crimea became the Autonomous Republic of Crimea, with closer political ties to Ukraine. This killed off the idea of Ukraine joining any kind of Russian world, for the time being at least. But the differences in identity that caused these ideas to emerge in the first place still existed, 
because Ukrainians and all the other post-Soviet peoples were still trying to find their footing, to understand what nations they belonged to and what it meant to be part of these nations. This was a struggle because they just didn't have a lot of practice. For the past century, their taste of nation building had been extremely brief, as they were beginning to find their way from the aftermath of the Russian Empire and other dying kingdoms, they were all swallowed back up into one country again, and meshed into one experimental, often confusing identity. The Soviet identity. With that identity gone, these people had to figure out what to do with themselves. And with a legacy of contradictory identity politics, that's easier said than done. To illustrate how problematic this became for Ukrainians, here are some quotes from an article by the Washington Post. Ukraine's politics have long been divided into two major factions of the country's demographics. Roughly speaking, about four out of every six people in Ukraine are ethnic Ukrainian and speak the Ukrainian language. Another one in six is ethnic Russian and speaks Russian. The last one in six is ethnic Ukrainian, but speaks Russian. Since it declared independence in 1991, the country has been politically divided along these ethnic linguistic lines. In national elections, people from districts dominated by the majority group, Ukrainian speakers who are ethnically Ukrainian, tend to vote for one candidate. And people from districts with lots of ethnic Russians or Russian speakers tend to vote for the other candidate. Ukraine's ethno-linguistic political division is sort of like the United States, Red America and Blue America divide. But in many ways much deeper. Imagine if Red and Blue Americans literally spoke different languages. The current political conflict, which at its most basic level is over whether the country will lean toward Europe or toward Russia, is like the Ukrainian equivalent of gun control, abortion and same-sex marriage, all rolled into one. Of course, this article's description is a generalization. Not every Russian speaker wanted closeness with Russia, or every Ukrainian speaker closeness with Western Europe. But Ukraine's ethnic and political divisions were clearly strong elements of society. And this is the kind of crisis that Ukraine found itself trapped in. Once again, the contradictions between self-determination and territorial integrity were rearing their ugly heads. Essentially, as Ukraine got closer and closer to becoming its own country, thanks to the largest nation on earth dissolving twice, first as the Russian Empire, second as the Soviet Union, the differences between sections of its society became harder to ignore. These gaps were widened with the resurgence of the far right in Ukraine, with Ukrainian expats from Germany returning home to reform the OUN as the Congress of Ukrainian Nationalists, or KUN for short. Local Ukrainians soon followed suit, and shortly after independence, there were several different far-right blocs emerging, earning a degree of sympathy and plenty of hate. Fast forward to 2010, and Ukraine has elected its fourth president, Viktor Yanukovych. Yanukovych was a politician that viewed Ukraine as a neutral power, one which should remain close to both the West and to Russia, and shouldn't join either's military alliances. In an attempt to balance the country's fragile sects, he also aimed to bring Russian speakers together with Ukrainian speakers, by recognizing Russian as a second official language alongside Ukrainian, passing a law to make minority languages official after two years in office. But Yanukovych was in a shaky position from the start, having narrowly been elected on only a 3% lead over his rival, Yulia Tymoshenko, with the west of the country overwhelmingly rejecting him and the east overwhelmingly supporting him. But where Ukraine's divide truly tore Yanukovych apart was the issue of membership of the European Union, where there wasn't much room for neutrality. EU membership was a policy with strong support in Ukraine's west, but much weaker support in its east. One camp wanted it, and the other camp didn't. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. Throughout his presidency, Yanukovych had pledged to support membership with the EU, but in late 2013, following pressure from Russia to back away, Yanukovych refused to sign an association agreement that would have brought Ukraine one step closer to EU membership. And his party rejected a number of reforms that the EU demanded as a condition for joining, essentially sabotaging their own application process. This sparked outrage among pro-Western elements of Ukrainian society, and led to the formation of the Euromaidan, a protest movement that demanded a return to plans for EU membership, and the resignation of Yanukovych and his government. 
pro-Russian elements of Ukraine responded with a counter-movement, the Anti-Maidan, in opposition to the protests. Large opposing forces born from Ukraine's long-running political divisions. To quote from the Washington Post again, Based on the protests in Kiev, it can sure look like Ukrainians want their country to integrate with the European Union and turn away from Russia. But in November, poll found slightly different attitudes. 45% said they wanted the EU deal. 14% said they wanted to join with the Russian-led trade union. And 41% said they were undecided or wanted neither. In other words, joining the EU is about as popular as not joining the EU. Both of which are more popular than snuggling up to Moscow. It's a safe bet that ethnic linguistic Ukrainians would be more likely to want the EU deal. Europe is often seen as the alternative to Russia. So supporting EU integration is a little like supporting not Russia. The mass protests and thus most foreign journalists are in the capital of Kiev. But President Yanukovych is from the eastern, more Russian part of the country where he served as a regional governor for several years. In 2010, 74.7% of Kievans voted for Yanukovych's opponent. It's not shocking that they would want him to leave office. Things are different in the other end of the country. As the scholars Katarina and Roman Volzug wrote, in Russophone eastern and southern Ukraine, Lenin is still respected by many, despite communism's obsolescence even there. This weekend, when protesters in Kiev toppled an old statue of founding Soviet leader Vladimir Lenin, some Ukrainians in the Russian-speaking part of the country expressed outrage. The protesters out in the streets in Kiev are showing remarkable bravery and political will. They have some very real grievances that have nothing to do with ethnic or linguistic lines, particularly government corruption and the troubled economy. But what we're seeing is, in some very important ways, a function of a demographic divide that Ukrainian politics have never really bridged. But the conflict wasn't as simple as the pro-EU Maidan and the pro-Russia anti-Maidan. Within the Maidan, there was another element as well, the far right, who sought to exploit the unrest for their own agenda and give their idolization of World War II era Nazi collaborators like Stepan Bandera and the SS Galicia division a more mainstream platform. They had almost nothing in common with the rest of the Maidan, which consisted mostly of liberals, progressives and moderates but the two sides shared an opposition to Yanukovych and to Russian influence. The most notable of these far-right groups were the Spoda Party, which emerged in the early 2000s, and the Right Sector, which materialized during the Maidan itself, a coalition of various far-right groups, including elements of the KUN. These two groups united with several pro-EU liberal parties in a formal organization called All Ukrainian Union Maidan, which formed paramilitary groups known as the Maidan Self-Defense Groups to lead the fight against the anti-Maidan and the government forces. The far-right and liberal groups of the Maidan quietly tolerated each other to oppose these mutual enemies, even as the far-right set out to hijack the Maidan's agenda and replace it with their own. And hijack they did. These groups were not widely supported by Ukrainians in either the East or the West, but they were militant, prominent, and willing to go all out to oppose both Yanukovych and Russian influence. Fighters loyal to groups like Right Sector led the charge at the helm of the self-defense groups. The visibility of far-right groups like Right Sector during the Maidan protests increased the hostility of the anti-Maidan in response, as they began to see the modern Ukrainian conflict between them and the Maidan as a kind of parallel with the conflict between Soviet Ukraine and the insurgent groups like Bandera's OUN of the 1940s. Suddenly, the anti-Maidan had a new name for Maidan supporters, Banderite. Ukraine's World War II legacy came back to haunt its people. After Yanukovych refused to compromise with the Euromaidan, with his government insisting there would be no return to negotiations with the EU, the crisis progressively got worse. The protests spiralled out of control and spread across Ukraine, leading to violent confrontations between the two protest camps and the police across the country. These confrontations escalated into riots and then, at the start of 2014, into a full-scale uprising, like a pin being pulled out of a grenade.
Waves of Maidan protesters began occupying government buildings across Ukraine, and by late January 2014, almost half of Ukraine's regional governments had been ousted and replaced by the rioters. These activists then declared the regions under their control to be independent from the central government, in some instances even banning the ruling party and its allies. With the west of Ukraine coming under the control of the separatists and the east remaining under the government, there was a genuine fear from some observers that Ukraine could be split into two states, one controlled by the opposition and the Maidan, and the other controlled by the government and the anti-Maidan. In a last-ditch attempt to prevent this kind of outcome, opposition leaders made a deal with the government on the 21st of February, where early elections would be held and more power would be transferred from the presidency to the Ukrainian parliament. But right sector and other opposition militants from the so-called Maidan defense groups rejected the deal, threatening to storm Yanukovych's house and the Ukrainian parliament building if the government didn't resign. The next day, Yanukovych fled Kyiv, and the militants took control of parliament and other government offices. During the occupation, opposition members of parliament impeached Yanukovych, appointed a new leadership headed by the opposition, known as the interim government, ousted top judges, and replaced the country's regional governors. The far-right movements benefited from this new leadership, with groups like Spoda receiving official posts in the new government. The impeachment process that brought this new government to power was unconstitutional, as rather than following the Ukrainian constitution's legal impeachment proceedings, which involve a trial for a specific crime, a two-thirds majority vote from the parliament to accept the claims from the trial, a vote from the Supreme Court to validate the decisions, and finally, a three-quarters vote for conviction, the opposition MPs instead passed a basic resolution declaring Yanukovych was absent from his post due to his flight from Kyiv, something which wasn't a crime or an impeachable offence. The opposition also failed to achieve the two-thirds majority due to an absence of most MPs from the ruling party during the vote. As a result of these irregularities, Yanukovych rejected the impeachment and maintained his claim to the presidency, resulting in a constitutional crisis. In terms of public support, in the east of Ukraine, an anti-Maidan stronghold, the local population was much more split on the Maidan than the rest of the country, where most had been willing to look past the murkiness involved in Yanukovych's removal, due to either a shared pro-Western sentiment with the new government, or a resentment for the violent role Ukrainian government forces played in the Maidan clashes under his watch. Poll results indicated that in the west of Ukraine, most believed that the Maidan had been a kind of revolution against the dictator, while in the east, it was seen as a coup against an elected leader. Many in the East didn't recognize the opposition's takeover, and much of the population had also begun to believe that a civil war was possible or certain. After leaving Kyiv for the Kharkiv region, Yanukovych later moved into exile in Russia, but he still refused to resign. He later gave a press conference denouncing the event as a coup and claiming he was shot at while leaving the capital. Shortly after, he requested that Russian troops intervene to restore order. Following this request, Russian troops crossed the Ukrainian border and entered the peninsula of Crimea. But not to restore law and order and Yanukovych's position as president of Ukraine, but rather to claim Ukrainian territory for themselves, surrounding and taking over military bases and Crimean government buildings with the support of pro-Russian activists. At first, the Russians played dumb, explaining these events away with the baffling excuse that these troops weren't Russian soldiers at all, but rather spontaneously formed self-defense groups made up of local Crimeans. The fact that their uniforms happened to be identical to that of Russian soldiers, only with the unit patches ripped off, was conveniently explained away as the self-defense groups having equipped themselves from army surplus shops. Later, the Russians dropped this act and admitted that the soldiers who looked and were equipped exactly like the Russian troops were in fact Russian troops. Funny that. A month after Russian forces deployed to Crimea, the Crimean parliament, under Russian occupation, issued a declaration of independence, proclaiming Crimea to be separate from Ukraine. Shortly after, a referendum was held in Crimea on joining Russia, with an official result of over 95% in favour of an 80% turnout. But there were a few obvious problems with this referendum. Firstly, there was no option to preserve the status quo. The only choices were joining Russia or returning to the 1992 Crimean constitution. In other words, moving further away from Ukraine or leaving it entirely. 
Second, status referendums in Ukraine have to be called by the Ukrainian presidency or parliament and be open to participation from the whole Ukrainian electorate, not just the territory which would change status. The Crimean referendum was organised by Crimeans acting under duress and neither President Yanukovych, the interim President Alexander Turchinov or the Ukrainian parliament approved the referendum. Third, status referendums have to be all Ukrainian referendums where citizens from across the country can take part. The Crimean referendum only allowed local Crimeans to take part. These factors made the referendum illegal under Ukrainian law. Legal issues aside, what matters most is whether the referendum represented the will of the people. When judging this, the first factor is impossible to look past. A yes or no referendum without a genuine no option can hardly claim to be a genuine consultation. But regardless of these issues, which prevented the referendum from being recognised internationally, the territory was promptly annexed into the Russian Federation, leaving Yanukovych bitter and regretful for allowing Russian troops into Ukraine. Shortly after, he faded from the political scene, and his claim to Ukraine's presidency was mostly forgotten. The crisis was no longer between his government and the interim government, but between the interim government and Russia. Emboldened by the takeover of Crimea, the anti-Maidan movement in mainland Ukraine turned to using the same tactics the Maidan had, rioting and occupying government buildings. This is Gorlipka, they're storming the building, throwing rocks through the windows, and the police inside are throwing out smoke grenades and stun grenades. They're breaking down the door now. The eastern regions of Kharkiv, Donetsk and Luhansk came under occupation from the anti-Maidan and with the changeover of power from Yanukovych to the new government, the political situation had taken a 180 degree turn. The anti-Maidan were now the separatists. What has happened is they've asked for international recognition and they've created a temporary government. This is how something like a country is created. Unable to advance westward due to the strength of the Maidan there, these forces later declared the regions they controlled to be three new countries, the Kharkiv People's Republic, Donetsk People's Republic and Luhansk People's Republic, independent from Ukraine. The activists in Kharkiv were pushed back shortly after and the region remained under Ukrainian control but Donetsk and Luhansk became split between pro-separatist and pro-Ukrainian forces. To prevent the Western authorities from further retaking territory, some of the anti-Maidan activists formed their own vigilante paramilitaries. Like the Maidan's groups, there was a distinct ideological split in these paramilitaries. Some of them were associated with the far left, some with the far right, and they were also split in origin. Some groups were local, others were connected to political groups inside Russia itself such as the Russian National Unity, which had figures that passed through its ranks leading the charge for the separatists, and the Russian Imperial Movement, which organised training for the separatist forces. Following their declarations of independence, the separatists in Donetsk and Luhansk held referendums in their regions to validate the decisions, similar to the Crimea referendum. Unlike the Crimea referendum, the referendums in Donbass proved to be extremely divisive, and were viewed internationally more as power plays than real expressions of opinion. No country gave them recognition, not even Russia. The result was a crisis of legitimacy and a land split between two rival centres of power, a government and a separatist bloc that had both taken power by illegal means. The Ukrainian security forces were utterly shattered by the takeover of Crimea and the uprising in Donbass, as most of them weren't combat ready, and most of those who were chose to defect to the separatists. According to a US scholar, the total number of usable troops and equipment in the ground forces amounted nominally to 80,000 personnel, 775 tanks, 51 helicopters, fewer than 1,000 artillery pieces, and 2,280 armored personnel carriers. In fact, due to a combination of lack of training and inadequate and poorly maintained equipment, the size of the combat-ready force was only 6,000 troops. Ministry of Interior Special Forces, like the Berkut, 
were dissolved after the shootings in Maidan. Between 25 and 30 percent of police and security forces in the Donbas region had defected to the separatist side, according to a MOI estimate. As a result, pro-Ukraine sign came to be led not by its army or its police forces, but by paramilitaries known as the Volunteer Battalions, many of which were successors of the self-defense groups of the Maidan, which had refused to disarm after the overthrow of Yanukovych. The right sector formed a group called the Ukrainian Volunteer Corps. Spoda formed a group called the Sitch Battalion. One of the constituent groups of right sector, Patriot of Ukraine, formed a militia known as the Black Corps. The growth of this militia movement increased the perception among Eastern Ukrainians that their country had been captured by the Banderites, while the emergence of Russian citizens in the pro-Russian forces led those in the West to believe they were fighting a kind of hybrid war with Russia itself. The vigilantes controlling the streets became the soldiers controlling the front lines. To resolve the ongoing constitutional crisis, presidential elections were held in Ukraine by the so-called interim government in May 2014, followed by parliamentary elections in October. These resulted in a win for pro-EU liberal leader Petro Poroshenko and his political group, the Petro Poroshenko Bloc, which formed a government that was recognised internationally, including by Russia. The far right badly lost out, with Spoda losing 31 seats and the right sector gaining only one, their only seat in the parliament. This led to them losing their places in Ukraine's leadership. But by this point, it was too late for a smooth resolution to the crisis, and the far right still held a disproportionate amount of influence through their sway over many of the volunteer battalions. These battalions were then given legal power and status by being formally incorporated into the Ukrainian government under newly created units of the Ukrainian military and police, the National Guard, Territorial Defense Battalions, and Special Tasks Patrol Police. Following these elections, the pro-Russia separatists refused to recognize the new government's mandate and had established control over large parts of the Donbass region for their republics. They too formalized the vigilantes that had backed their side, organizing them into what was called the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Militias, the separatists' national armies. These two sides were in a state of war as they each tried to take over the Donbass region. After it was discovered that the Russian government was giving military aid to the separatists, the conflict commonly became grouped together with the Russian annexation of Crimea under one name, the Russo-Ukrainian War. The war continued for three months until September 2014, when the Russian, Ukrainian and separatist leaders signed an agreement called the Minsk Protocol, where it was agreed that there would be a ceasefire followed by a political solution. Separatist regions would be given autonomy and separatist fighters would be given immunity from prosecution. In exchange, the separatists would agree to reintegrate into Ukraine. But the agreement fell through as the ceasefire was periodically broken, with combat continuing across Donbass. The political process was also stalled, as the separatists showed no genuine interest in any reintegration with Ukraine, and Ukrainian politicians were unwilling to support the proposed amnesty for the separatists. Following this lack of progress, the separatists ended up holding their own elections in November 2014 with wins for the Russian nationalist Donetsk Republic and Peace for Luhansk parties, creating a parallel set of governments, one in Kyiv and two more in Donbass. In February 2015, an attempt to revive the diplomatic process was made, and a new agreement known as Minsk II was signed, based on the same idea of a ceasefire followed by autonomy in exchange for reintegration. But once again, it failed to be seriously implemented. Immediately after the deal was settled, the separatists vowed to not follow the ceasefire in a major area of fighting, the city of Debaltsev, and some Ukrainian volunteer units openly refused to follow the ceasefire at all. The result was a complete failure to achieve any political progress and a stalemate on the battlefield. The Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics remained separated from Ukraine, in control of about a third of the Donbass region. The Ukrainians were determined to lick their wounds and recover from these losses, and to help achieve that end, the Ukrainian government invited NATO troops into the country to train its army, as it attempted to rebuild its conventional forces. The work Yanukovych had put into compromising with Ukraine's two split groups progressively went out the window over time. His moves towards neutrality were ditched, as the country made a pro-Western, pro-NATO pivot, now firmly aligned against Russia and wary of further Russian encroachment. In 2019, Ukraine's next round of presidential elections saw the end of Petro Poroshenko's term in power, bringing in new President Volodymyr Zelensky, who brought new hope for Ukraine. 
He was pro-European, but a Russian speaker, a campaigner against corruption, and a far cry from the far right, having Jewish heritage, with family members that fought for the Red Army and fell victim to the Holocaust. He had the potential to be the unifier his predecessors weren't, and had an ambition to resolve the Donbass conflict through diplomacy with Russia, rather than through force. But one thing he was not willing to compromise on was guaranteeing Ukraine's security against further Russian land grabbing. And for him, that meant seeking membership in the NATO alliance, a red line for Russia. The tug of war between Russia and Ukraine over this issue continued until 2022, when Russia directly demanded to Western nations that they agree to keep Ukraine out of NATO, and invaded Ukraine when they refused. And now, we've reached the point where the war we know of began, and our first Ukraine documentary began its coverage. We can see that Ukraine is a very complicated country. Compared to most European nations, it's very young, but it has also seen a great amount of history. From the very beginning in 1918 and 1919, Ukraine was split between dozens of different factions, with different ideas of how it should be run, and how close it should be with neighbours like Russia, struggling countless times for independence against multiple empires and rival nationalists. During the Second World War, these issues resurfaced as Ukraine was fought over by the Soviets and Germans. And now, it seems that this new war is bringing these divisions to the surface all over again. Ukraine watched as the biggest nation on Earth collapsed, and then watched it happen again in the same century. Each time, it came out of that experience looking very different. The question now is, what will Ukraine look like after watching what happens to Russia this time around? Hello viewers and listeners, I hope you have been enjoying the presentation so far. The video will resume shortly, however, before it does, I would love to inform you of this video's sponsors. Ourselves, and our dear supporters who help fund these videos. Some guy from Oz, and Jenny. This production is only the first part of four, and it has been in a production hell for a long time. Elwood began writing the script about over a year and a half ago and traveled to Germany to record most of the voiceover for the series. Editing took over and will take over a good amount of time as well. With these video productions essentially being hobbyist projects, there sadly is no other choice but to hang up a project for a while and pick it up again later. However, you can help with turning this hobby project into a serious endeavor. Donations are paramount for productions like these. The Ukrainian Divide took months to write and will still take additional months to fully edit. Videos of this scope are unsustainable in the long run, as YouTube will likely demonetize the entire series, meaning that the cost of producing The Ukrainian Divide will likely never be recuperated. If you would like to support our efforts, you can send a donation on PayPal, subscribe to the Patreon or Gumroad, or send a super thanks on YouTube. However, I think it is better for you to get something in return for your support. Mega the Ukrainian Divide, the entire series, is available on Gumroad as a pre-order. What you will get are the full Atlas episodes uploaded in high quality and with uncompressed sound as the episodes release on YouTube, alongside the Obsidian Vaults for you to read along and take notes in a chapter-by-chapter -chapter manner. Eventually, the Gumroad product will include bonus content such as the original soundtrack especially made for Mega. Making off behind the scenes that will be especially interesting to up-and-coming documentary producers and for the people who are generally interested in behind the scenes content and some assets that have been created for the documentary. The pre-order is a one-time purchase and once the entire series is finished, the bonus content will get added to the product. If you pre-order now, you will get a discounted price, $20 instead of $30 and you will get all subsequent content later as it is uploaded. All the content is completely DRM free and can be downloaded locally. You have full control over the files and once you purchase, you will always be able to log back in and download what you need later. I don't want to hold you up any longer. Let us continue with chapter two.
In the announcement of the invasion in February 2022, Russian President Vladimir Putin spoke about demilitarizing Ukraine entirely and encouraged Ukrainian soldiers to take power into their own hands. It was obvious that the Russian goal was regime change, overthrowing Ukraine's government and replacing it with one friendly to Russian interests, to kill off any chances of Ukraine ever becoming a member of NATO or a rival to Russia. The Russian military had split their so-called special military operation in Ukraine into two phases, the demilitarization of Ukraine and the liberation of Donbass. In other words, defeating the Ukrainian military and annexing the pro-Russian separatist dominated regions in Donetsk and Luhansk. At the start of the conflict, it seemed like the Russians were on track to achieve both of these war goals. Instead, only a few weeks later and less than a month after we released our video, things changed dramatically. Russia says the first phase of what it calls a military operation in Ukraine was mostly complete. According to senior military official Sergei Rudskoy, uh, the Russian forces have almost entirely destroyed Ukraine's air and naval forces. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, however, said resistance from Ukrainian forces has dealt a powerful blow to Russia. In terms of casualties... The Russian military retreated from their positions near Kyiv and its surrounding regions and claimed that their first phase was complete, stating that they were moving their aims towards the second phase. Russia's ambitions had seemingly shrunk dramatically as they went from planning to dominate a whole country to capturing only a small corner of it. But the question is, why? It's all a case of expectations versus results. The Russian military intended to sweep through Ukraine and silence its forces in a matter of days, a pushover battle where they expected to be welcomed by the people they were conquering, a misleading attitude not unlike the one held by US troops as they invaded Iraq 20 years ago. But while the US tried to maintain their presence and turn the tide for years, the Russians chose to cut their losses and leave, realising that there would be no fall of Kyiv, no wave of Ukrainian soldiers responding to Putin's call by switching sides, and no throngs of Ukrainians leaping into Russia's embrace. On the other hand, the Russian forces believed that the Donbass was a better point to hold their ground, as it was a region where, unlike the rest of Ukraine, the feeling of Russian identity and sympathy for pro-Russian separatism was more widespread. While Zelensky tried to encourage Russia to give up on this plan and cut a deal for peace by conceding that Ukraine wouldn't be able to join NATO a month after the invasion began, things were too late by then and the Russians stuck to their plans. They also expanded the scope of their phase two goals to include three more regions of Ukraine, Kharkiv, Zaporizhia and Kherson. The idea being that having eastern regions of Ukraine under Russian control would create a buffer between Russia and Ukraine and create a Russian occupied land bridge to Crimea. The end goal was to hold referendums in these regions on joining Russia, ensuring their status as Russian enclaves. This gamble initially seemed to be paying off well enough. By July 2022, all of the Luhansk region was under Russian control, along with over half of Donetsk and Kharkiv, while the Zaporizhia and Kherson regions had been under majority Russian control since the early stages of the war. In these regions, Russian passports were handed out, Russian SIM cards replaced Ukrainian cards, the Russian currency replaced the Ukrainian currency. The blueprint of 2014's annexation of Crimea was being followed. These regions would become like Russia, then become Russia. But with the exception of Luhansk, none of the regions that were part of this plan were under total Russian or separatist rule. All of them still had sizable sections contested by Ukraine. By this point, the conflicts almost began to resemble something like the First World War. A conflict marked by constant combat and death, but only small changes in territory for either side. Through mid-2022, a war that had previously been shocking, bombastic, and the top of news bulletins across the world turned static and forgotten. Brutal, but static.
For the following months, most of the movement from this point was diplomatic. Even after Russia started meddling in Ukraine in 2014, a perception was starting to build that NATO was a relic of the past. Commentators were declaring it obsolete, a remnant of an old order designed to contain a threat that didn't really exist. Russia wasn't made a pariah, wasn't battered with sanctions, it essentially got a free pass to have its way in the region. But in trying to swallow Ukraine whole, the Russians had pushed their luck too far, with the biggest shift being the movement of two more countries to join NATO, Finland and Sweden. These were two countries that before the war in Ukraine had no interest in NATO membership at all. But after seeing the Russian army storming across Ukraine's borders and starting a new war in Europe, they changed their minds and opted to be in the safety net of a military alliance. Ironically, a war that Vladimir Putin started to contain NATO may actually be causing it to expand even further, as the Russian leadership's attempts to threaten its neighbours create the exact reverse of their intended effect. Not fear, but defiance. Eventually, this period of quiet from Ukraine all changed in September 2022, as the Ukrainians, who since the Russian retreat near Kyiv had mostly been trying to stall Russian progress rather than retake territory, finally made moves to push forward and stop being on the back foot. The result was a counter-offensive that retook huge numbers of towns and villages, and advanced over 1,000 square miles, causing the Ukrainian military to retake almost all of the Kharkiv region, demolishing Russia's occupation in that area and sending remaining Russian troops fleeing towards Donetsk. This took Ukraine's troops all the way back to the Russian border. One of Russia's five buffers against Ukraine vanished in only a week. This huge sweep sent Russia's government into panic mode. Only days later, Russia's planned referendums were underway in the four remaining buffer regions, and Russian politicians announced a military partial mobilization, a call up to send hundreds of thousands of Russian conscripts into the war. This was Russia's first mobilization since World War II, representing a dramatic escalation. After five days of voting, pro-Russian officials announced on the 28th of September 2022 that all four of the Russian-held regions in eastern Ukraine had voted to secede from Ukraine and join the Russian Federation. The official results showed that 80% of voters supported joining Russia, with a turnout of over 70% in all four regions. Two days later, on September 30th, pro-Russian figures in the regions signed treaties in Moscow, uniting their territories with Russia and causing outrage in Ukraine, where Zelensky reversed his abandonment of a NATO bid and formally applied to join the alliance. So the question again is, why? What would Russia gain from these actions? The reasons for mobilization are obvious. If you aren't doing well in a war, bringing up more troops to replace your losses always helps. But what about the annexations? Well, Russia's military system is a hybrid between a volunteer and a conscript army. Every able-bodied male citizen between 18 and 27 has to serve in the military for 12 months as part of conscription. But there's a catch. Russian conscripts only have to serve inside Russia itself. They can only be sent to fight in foreign countries if they volunteer by signing a contract agreeing to do so. Annexing the eastern parts of Ukraine made them parts of Russia itself rather than foreign territory under Russian law. So in the eyes of Russia's legal system, a region like Luhansk or Donetsk was no less Russian than Moscow or St. Petersburg. This meant that the Russian military was no longer limited in how many of its conscripts it could send to the conflict with Ukraine by the contracts. Theoretically, any soldier that was conscripted into Russia's armed forces was now eligible to be sent, rather than only the volunteers, allowing Russia to boost its troop numbers in the four buffer regions dramatically if the conscripts were given enough training. The call-up caused a split reaction from many military-aged Russians. Many boarded buses to be sent to military training centres, and formed long queues at recruiting offices, being greeted by rallies of supporters thanking them for joining the fight. But others fled the country to avoid being part of the draft, leaving either through land borders with countries like Finland and Georgia, or through air routes to neighbouring countries like Armenia or Turkey, where flights reportedly quickly sold out. Others, who didn't want to leave the country but didn't want to be drafted, resorted to even more extreme measures, with violent attacks on recruitment centres across Russia.
On paper, the draft had a select, strict criteria, as the name partial mobilisation would suggest, with only military age reservists or veterans being drafted. In practice, there were cases of civilians outside of that criteria, even the old and the disabled, being included in the call-up, contributing to the violent backlash and exodus of refugees, forcing Russia's government to throw its own officials under the bus. <laughs> С подобным текстом отправлять людей всем муж, гражданам мужского пола города Дербента. Вы мне скажите, что это за идиоты? Всем гражданам мужского пола срочно прибыть в военный комиссариат, при себе иметь военный бед. Вы что, дебилы, блядь, а? Кто их уполномочил ездить по городу? Это не что иное, как распространение фейковой информации, за которую сегодня тоже предусмотрены статьи Уголовного кодекса. Some aggregators at the time reported a total of almost 1 million Russians left their country as part of this exodus, with a speculated total in the range of 700,000 people. Given that just one country bordering Russia, Kazakhstan, had reported that over 200,000 Russians had fled the country through its borders only two weeks after the draft began, this figure may actually be plausible. This number was roughly equal to the total number of Russians who had been successfully drafted into the war in the same period. In this city, hundreds of miles from the Russian border, I spoke with dozens of newly arrived Russians, ranging from doctors. If we refuse to go to this war, we should go to the jail. To engineers, IT specialists and university students. You ran away from Russia? Yeah, from mobilization, from... Uh... From military service. Yeah, yeah. Most don't want to be identified to protect loved ones still in Russia. How can I take part in the war without a wish to win this war? The reaction to these refugees was split. Some figures encouraged openness and support, while others promoted fear-mongering and collective guilt, blaming the Russians for the war simply for being Russian and demanding they be sent home. You might ask, why would anti-Russia activists want these refugees to be deported back, where they could be forced into the war effort? Well, the thinking was that those who opposed the war effort should have stayed in Russia and worked towards overthrowing Putin, a mentality similar to the use of sanctions in other countries. Make life worse, and the people will do the regime change for you. But sending refugees back to a country where jail sentences of over a decade await them if they resist, isn't exactly the most humane way of looking at things, nor is it practical. Trying to turn people who don't want to be activists into political cannon fodder isn't going to inspire willing change in Russia. Imagine what would happen if you demanded refugees from Afghanistan be forced to go back and fight the Taliban. A lot of people would be outraged. But it was popular to hate Russia, so people overlook this double standard just as they have towards other wartime enemies in the past. Unfortunately for Russia's government, their mobilization plans were slow burning. The reality is that you can't just grab people off the streets and send them to fight if you want to see results. Training is needed to turn civilians into soldiers. And while Russia's conscripts were busy training, the Ukrainians kept taking more and more ground away, causing the embarrassing imagery of Russian troops running away from the territory their country had just annexed, and their leaders trying to cover up their losses prompting criticism from even passionate pro-war supporters. By the time the Ukrainian offensive was over, and the conflict had again relapsed into a frozen stalemate, the one regional capital Russian forces controlled, Kherson City, had been lost, and the Ukrainians had successfully rolled back Russian troops in approximately half of occupied territory.
In the face of these serious setbacks, the Russians were keen to retake the initiative and show their population that they were still capable of achieving successes on the battlefield, launching new offensives in early 2023. This plan was mostly a failure, with no significant changes on the battlefield or shifts in the balance of power. But Russia was able to claim one notable battlefield victory, the capture of a city in the Donetsk region called Bakhmut, also referred to by an older name, Artemovsk, by Russian sources. The takeover of this city was lauded by the Russian press and its participants were labelled as heroes. But the interesting thing is, the soldiers behind this victory weren't Russian troops. This is Yevgeny Prigozhin. He's not a commander or even a member of the Russian military. He's a businessman and the soldiers next to him are from a once mysterious private military company called the Wagner Group. Wagner is an organisation that has been around for a long time. The group was reportedly founded in 2014 by Prigozhin and an ex spetsnaz agent known as Dmitry Utkin. The group participated in the early separatist conflicts in Donbass, but also other conflict regions of interest to Russia, specifically Syria, Libya, the Central African Republic and Mali. For many years, Wagner did not officially exist. Prigozhin denied any links to paramilitary activity and the group went mostly unacknowledged. In fact, Wagner technically was never even a legal organisation because forming paramilitary groups is a crime in Russia. But it seems this group was allowed to operate to give the Kremlin an opportunity to pursue some of its military ambitions with plausible deniability. However, with the invasion of Ukraine, the mask slipped. Prigozhin admitted his involvement with Wagner and the group began clearly working alongside Russian troops as a participant in the invasion. But Wagner's value didn't just come from its arm's length relationship with the Kremlin. The group is also a valuable asset to the Russians because of its talent pool, being an organisation filled with battle-hardened mercenaries who don't easily shy away from a fight or from swinging their favourite tool around, the sledgehammer, which has become emblematic for the organisation as a whole. Put simply, the group was ruthless towards its enemies and towards any potential traitors. Wagner also acted as a source for disposable manpower as part of the war effort, with Prigozhin, an ex-criminal himself, recruiting prisoners to fight for the company, promising forgiven sentences for those who survived and warning that falling behind would be considered a death sentence. This combination of hardened mercenaries and disposable crooks created a force that was capable of achieving successes where regular Russian forces could only produce stagnation. But being an extra-legal group staffed by criminals operating outside of the military's control, Wagner was volatile and at odds with the rest of the invasion force, having a tighter bond to Prigozhin rather than the leader of their country. During the capture of Bakhmut, Prigozhin had a habit of posting angry rants to his social media sources, accusing Russian generals of mismanaging the war and not providing his company with enough resources. And even after the end of the battle, these rants continued, with Prigozhin accusing the Russian military of mining the route out of the city, and even briefly arresting a Russian officer for shooting at one of his convoys. As more and more news of Prigozhin's outbursts emerged, it became clear that the Wagner Group was a powder keg, and that while his forces were aligned to the Kremlin, it wasn't a cosy relationship. To resolve this standoff, the Russian Defence Ministry issued an order demanding that the paramilitary forces of the war effort sign contracts with the Russian military, bringing them fully under government control. But this demand produced the exact opposite of what the Kremlin was hoping for, prompting Prigozhin to make his boldest move yet. After the Russian offensive died down, Ukraine responded with a new counter-offensive in mid-2023 that also produced lacking results. But in this period, while most Russian forces were busy defending their front lines, Prigozhin decided to execute his plan. Suddenly, on the early evening of July 23rd, Prigozhin delivered a furious speech on his Telegram account, stating that the Russian government was lying to its people about the Ukraine conflict, noting that neither Ukraine or NATO had been planning any sort of attack on Russia, stating that Zelensky had been ready to negotiate and even going as far as saying that the real cause for the invasion had been to enrich an oligarchic clan of mentally ill scumbags. 
He essentially demolished Russia's entire narrative of an aggressive Ukraine and Russia acting in self-defense, and slammed Russia's military leaders as a gang of crooks. I guess it takes one to know one. Even after that, not many could have predicted that the Wagnerites would try to swing their sledgehammers at Putin's head. But that's exactly what happened. Soviet commander of Chivika Wagner принял решение. Зло, которое несет военное руководство страны, должно быть остановлено. Они пренебрегают жизнями солдат. Они забыли слово справедливость, и мы вернем ее. Поэтому те, кто уничтожили сегодня наших парней, те, кто уничтожили десятки, многие десятки тысяч жизней русских солдат, будут наказаны. Я прошу никому не оказывать сопротивление. Все, кто будут пытаться оказать это сопротивление, мы будем считать, что это угроза, и уничтожать немедленно, включая любые блокпосты, вставшие на нашем пути, любую авиацию, которую увидим над своими головами. Я прошу всех сохранять спокойствие, не поддаваться на провокации, оставаться в своих домах, желательно по маршруту нашего следования не выходить на улицу. После того, как мы закончим начатое, мы вернемся на фронт для защиты нашей Родины. Президентская власть, правительство... МВД, Росгвардия и другие структуры будут работать дальше в привычном порядке. Мы разберемся с теми, кто уничтожает русских солдат и вернемся на фронт. Справедливость в войсках будет восстановлена, а после этого справедливость для всей России. In the early hours of July 24th, Wagner troops left their bases and crossed the border from the disputed territories of Donbass into Russia proper, sending a massive convoy towards the city of Rostov in what Prigozhin was calling a march of justice. Within hours, the official state media of Russia, TASS, announced that criminal cases had been opened against Prigozhin and the Wagner group on charges of mutiny and claimed that entry towards Rostov was being blocked by military checkpoints. But these checkpoints completely failed to stop the Wagner advance, as in the morning, Wagner troops entered the center of Rostov city and took control of the Russian military headquarters there, which was also the control center for the entire Ukraine war effort. An hour later, 4 a.m. GMT, footage emerged of Prigozhin himself at the headquarters with senior Russian military officials, threatening that if the chief of the Russian general staff, Valery Gerasimov, did not come to Rostov to meet him, Prigozhin would go to Moscow. The unthinkable was confirmed. A rebel force had marched into a major Russian city and taken over without a fight. Wagner was launching a coup. We are in the stab at 7.30 of the morning under control of the military objects of Rostov, in particular the aerodrome. The aircraft that are going to be used for military work are going to be state. Проблем никаких нету. Санитарные борта уходят, проблем нет. Все, что делается, это мы взяли под контроль, чтобы штурмовая авиация не наносила удары по нам, а наносила по украинцам. Главный штаб управления, главный пункт управления работает в штатном режиме. Проблем никаких нет, ни один офицер не оторван. Поэтому, когда вам будут рассказывать о том, что ЧВК Вагнер помельчала работе, И поэтому на фронте что-то посыпалось, на фронте посыпалось не поэтому. Когда мы пришли сюда, то мы еще раз подтвердили много новое. Огромное количество территорий потеряно. Солдат убитых в 3 в четыре раза больше, чем это в документах подается наверх. А то, что подается, это в 10 раз меньше, чем говорят по телевизору. Санитарные потери в день составляют некоторые дни до тысячи человек. Это убитые, без вести пропавшие, раненые и так называемые отказники, которые отказываются не потому, что они струсили, я уже говорил, а потому что у них выхода нет, боеприпасов нет, управления нет. Начальник 
генерального штаба бежал отсюда, как только узнал о том, что мы подходим к зданию. Unsurprisingly, Gerasimov didn't show up, and it became clear that the Wagner forces were following through on their threat. While some soldiers remained in Rostov to secure control of the city, the rest of the troops continued their convoy on the 12-hour drive to Moscow. By 5 a.m. GMT, footage emerged of Wagner forces at the halfway point of the journey, Voronezh. And as more and more civilians posted footage to social media of the convoy passing along its route, it became clear what the Russian authorities were up against a patchwork of military trucks, civilian vehicles, and BMP armored personnel carriers. By this point, Vladimir Putin finally emerged to give a short five-minute speech, justifying the Ukraine war, accusing the Wagner forces of treason, and promising to stabilize the situation in Rostov-on-Don. The most this amounted to was a convoy of Kremlin loyalist Chechens being sent to Rostov to retake the city, but they got stuck in a traffic jam. <laughs> Yes, seriously. Shortly after the speech, Prigozhin responded with a direct criticism of the Russian president. По поводу предательства Родины, президент глубоко ошибся. Мы патриоты своей Родины. Мы воевали и воюем. Все бойцы ЧВК Вагнер. И никто не собирается по требованию президента ФСБ или еще кого-нибудь прийти с повинной. Потому что мы не хотим, чтобы страна жила дальше в коррупции, в обмане и в бюрократии. Когда мы воевали в Африке, нам говорили о том, что нам нужна Африка, а после этого ее бросили, потому что разворовали все деньги, которые должны были идти на помощь. Когда нам говорили о том, что мы воим с Украиной, мы шли и воевали. Но выяснилось, что боеприпасы, вооружение, все деньги, которые были положены на них, также разворовываются, а чинуши сидят, экономят их для себя, как раз для того случая, который наступил сегодня, когда кто-то идет на Москву. Теперь они не экономят ничего, они бьют самолетами и вертолетами по колоннам, где идет мирняк, при этом бьют по мирняку, потому что не попадают и бьют куда попало. Поэтому мы патриоты, а те, кто сегодня нам противостоит, это те, кто собрались вокруг подонков. The steady progression of the convoy, despite Putin's clear stance against the mutiny, made it clear that the Kremlin was paralyzed, with its defenses along the route only including troops from Russia's National Guard, who were unwilling or unable to attack the convoy. As the day progressed, the Wagner forces were getting closer and closer to their target, reaching the Lipetsk region, four hours away from Moscow, by midday GMT. And as it became clear that this was a serious threat, the Russian government organized a series of retaliations, preparing checkpoints equipped with grenade launchers on the outskirts of Moscow, ordering Wagner-affiliated social media accounts to be blocked, and having roads dug up with excavators to block the routes available to the convoy. By 4 p.m., social media reports of Wagner Group reaching the Moscow region had emerged, which matched with appearances on Google Maps of traffic jams in the region, showing that the convoy was roughly two hours away from the Moscow city center. But it was this point that the tide began to turn. Reports of Russian troops preparing to leave the front in Ukraine to defend Moscow, and footage of Russian Marines pledging their loyalty to Putin appeared on social media. And around an hour later, it emerged that Prigozhin had negotiated with a close ally of Russia, President Lukashenko of Belarus, on a deal to stop the convoy and send the mutineers back to base. After 12 hours of chaos, the coup attempt was over, and by 7pm, Wagner was seen retreating from Rostov city, returning the area to Russian military control. According to the Institute for the Study of War, a conflict analysis think tank, the furthest point the convoy reached was the village of Krasno, roughly an hour away from the Moscow city center. As a result, we didn't find out what Prigozhin was planning to do if he actually reached Moscow. Did he want to outright remove Putin or keep him as a figurehead? Someone who gets to call the shots in civilian politics, but not the war effort? We'll likely never know. So looking at the aftermath of this, we have two questions. Why did Prigozhin agree to turn back and why did Putin allow him to continue breathing? 
Most likely, Prigozhin realized that, unlike all the other areas Wagner's convoy had reached, in Moscow there would be real resistance to his forces, and Wagner wasn't ready for a brutal prolonged battle in the middle of Russia's capital. As for Putin, he probably realized that having his troops in open combat with fighters that the Russian media had only months before been praising as heroic patriots for their actions in Bakhmut would be bad PR. But even with this peaceful resolution, a major leader in Russia's forces going rogue and uprooting the Kremlin's entire propaganda narrative was clearly a major blow to Russia's image, something we can especially see from the damage control the Russian press attempted in the coup's aftermath. While at the time of the Bakhmut battle, Putin himself was quoted in the media congratulating Wagner for their heroic accomplishments and promising medals, after the mutiny attempt, the Russian press tried to pull off a 180, presenting the narrative that while many Wagner fighters were true patriots, their efforts in Bakhmut weren't actually very important or impressive on the grand scale of things, and reports of their effectiveness were just a myth. Although ultimately the front lines in Ukraine didn't change much during or immediately after the coup attempt, the credibility of the war effort was certainly undermined. An invasion sold to the Russian people as bringing stability and ending a conflict instead brought instability and massively expanded that conflict. That was a blow many expected would be too much for the Kremlin. In the weeks after the mutiny, many commentators speculated that Prigozhin was a dead man walking. Two months later, they were proven right. In August 2023, Prigozhin published his first video after the mutiny, filming a Wagner recruitment pitch in Africa, and only days later on a return trip to Russia, his plane suddenly crashed, killing all on board. The Kremlin presented this as a tragic aviation accident, while Wagner supporters claimed the plane had been purposefully shot down by Russian air defense. Others speculated a bomb might have been detonated on board the plane itself. Either way, a loose end for Putin was tied up. And to us? Well, let's put it this way. It seems like Prigozhin became Icarus, flying too close to the sun. While Russia managed to squash this particular crisis, what happens next, only time will tell. Since the events of the mutiny, the overall battlefield has barely changed, despite many battles and lives lost. Both sides have little to show for their roles in the conflict in 2023. Ukraine's ambitions of driving the Russians into the Sea of Azov, retaking their lost southern lands and preparing for a march on Crimea have fallen far short. But in return, Russia's goal of strangling Ukrainians into submission forcing them to recognize the theft of territory they call home has also failed. The result is a bleak future where no one knows how far off the horizon peace may be, when the bombs will stop falling and when loved ones will stop being called to sacrifice. In this state, it seems the most likely outcome of the war will be a frozen conflict. The battle lines will stabilize, the shooting will stop or at least lessen, but no agreements or surrenders will be signed just a limbo where neither force can dislodge the other, an uneasy peace with no resolution. But both combatants are playing the long game, believing that at some point there will be another curveball event. Russia hopes that the political will of Ukraine's allies in Europe and the US will falter, causing the weapons supplies to run out and the road to securing their occupation to open. Ukraine is hoping that before that could happen, Russians will realize how much they're wasting for shattered colonies and turn on the leaders sending them to the front. These curveballs are possible. The Wagner mutiny paralyzed and almost toppled the stability of the Kremlin, with Prigozhin and his grunts showing the depth of discontent some of Russia's warriors have for their commanding officers. While in the US, there is a serious prospect of a former president sympathetic to the Kremlin returning to power, cutting Ukraine off from its strongest supporter 
and forcing Europeans to choose whether or not to take up the lead and sacrifice more to fuel Ukraine's cause, or give way to a resurgent Russia. In the end, the question is simple. Will either side break? And if so, who breaks first? This war has seen the emergence, or resurgence, of many competing national ideas, which are not only territorial, but ideological. The state of the war, either stagnation or destruction, will decide whose ideas shape the future of Ukraine, Russia, and maybe other nations too. How these countries navigate their challenges could define our future. With so many unknowns, we can't tell you what the answer to these questions will be, or which of these ideas will triumph. We are not military experts, only writers and researchers with a keen eye for dissecting narratives. So we can only wait and see what the future holds. But we'll do our best to inform and promote truth as best we see it over simplistic, romantic or malicious propaganda lines. Just be warned, it will get messy. Until next time, thank you for watching Mega.
Oh, <laughs> my 